Make, make some, make some noise. noise. It's Making Monsters with Taylor Dahl. It's like beer and brats. A perfect combination. You know the deal. <laughs> All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Making Monsters. We're continuing on this off-season project, talking about some of the potential guys the Bears could take, whether that's at nine, whether they trade back maybe to 11, 12, 13, 14, who they could snag there. Um, also options, obviously, if they do trade back and they gain a second round pick or if they're, you know, maybe a little later in the draft, a lot of ways we can go. Uh, there's a few guys that I want to talk about from the Texas Longhorns, and that's why today we are joined by C.J. Vogel. He is a college football insider and recruiting analyst um, covering Texas Longhorns for Texas uh, for on Texas football. So, C.J., thanks so much for hopping on with me. Yeah, absolutely. I know the there's a lot of momentum going on in the Windy City right now, and you know there's uh, some momentum going down in Austin. So, if the two could collide, that'd be a uh, best best case for the NFL in my eyes. Yeah, I like it. I, I think Texas football, um, some big things coming, obviously, this next season with Texas football. Uh, but they, they were a fun team to watch. And when we talk about even last year, uh, a lot of the talk was around Bijan. We ended up getting Roshan, um, which I'm still a big fan. We're waiting to see a little bit more from Roshan this season. But uh, I was pumped when I got him, uh, when we got him. Bijan obviously was that guy. But I think that when you look back, and let me ask you that, like when you look back at uh, Roshan, if Bijan wasn't there, was would Roshan have been the guy? Oh, without a doubt. And Roshan's a, a, a very unique football player to me. Obviously, he comes in as a quarterback because Texas was so thin at the running back spot. He willingly said, Coach Coach Herman, let me, let me see what I can do back here and let's see if I can get on the field at the running back spot. Obviously, Texas had Sam Ellinger at the time. But, you know, in, in the world of NIL, you know, social media now and college football specifically, I don't think you'll ever see another – backup running back or reserve running back be the voice, the heart, the entire heartbeat of your football program. And that's what Roshan Johnson was for Texas early on in Sarkeesian's tenure in Austin. Uh, you don't see that very often. It speaks to the, the character that he has and the willingness to do whatever it takes to win on the field. Uh, and, you know, to your to your question about if Bijan was not there, absolutely Roshan would have been the bell cow. He would have been uh, probably a day two pick without a question of a doubt. So uh, I'm glad he's up in Chicago. I'm glad that they've got some pieces around him now. And so uh, it'll be interesting to see what kind of year he puts on in year two. I'm definitely excited for that year too. I know last year um, things were a little crazy in, in Chicago. The offensive line, there was a, a lot of rotating pieces. So the, as the Bears had one of the best run games in the league, but they used um, they used a little bit of all of the backs. Justin Fields obviously was a big portion of that run game, and now without Justin Fields, you would expect the backs to take a little bit more of that. Uh, let's go. Let's, let's start. All right, so let's start with one of the guys that I think we're we're hearing a lot about, um, definitely in a lot in the top fifteen. Um, and for the Bears, it's not technically one of their biggest needs. So that's where a lot of people's uh, concerns are. There, I, you would say quarterback, obviously, that looks like it'll be Caleb Williams. But when you go beyond that, wide receiver, uh, edge is another one, um, interior offensive line. And then probably behind that is defensive tackle or somewhere in that interior defensive line. So uh, not one of the highest needs, but sometimes when you find a player that you really like, you'll you'll push that a little bit and add some more depth or maybe a piece that you really feel like will change your, your defense. So let's, when you talk about Byron Murphy, um, looking at the Longhorns defense, uh, defensive line, his freshman and sophomore year, what was going on those couple years? Because you saw him play in almost every game, but he didn't quite solidify that starting spot ne spot yet. Um, so what was going on uh, between that time of where he, where he kind of did start to solidify his role there? Yeah, really, it was just, you know, for him, it was earning his role. You know, it's not very easy uh, for, for these guys at Texas to get on the field right away in, early on in their career, especially when you're behind a guy like Keandre Coburn, who's now with the Chiefs, and uh, Mauro Ojimo, who was selected last year in the draft as well. The two of them had been on campus for quite a while beforehand. Uh, they had that tenure on him, uh, eventually making it very difficult for him to, to earn that role. We saw it a little bit in 2022 uh, when he's really started to come on later in the year. 
year. You, you could see things starting to click up top. And we knew he had the athleticism. Of course, he was a middle school running back uh, in DeSoto, which is one of the, the biggest high schools, uh, state championship high schools in the state of Texas. So he had the athleticism. It was all about kind of piecing things together and finding that consistency, which he obviously did find a year ago. And now, yeah. uh, as you mentioned, you know, kind of mocked right now in the, in the mid-teens. He, he kind of really put – his best effort forward a year ago and things are really starting to look for uh, bright for him now. Yeah. Which obviously it worked out because now we're talking about him being a, you know, top 15, top 10 draft pick. So when you are, when you look at that time, his three seasons there, his junior season, when he really kind of clicked with that role and took over that starting spot, uh, it, leading him to a big 12 defensive lineman of the year award, by the way, uh, what happened? What do you think improved the most during those three years to where you really felt like he kind of took control of his, his spot on that defensive line? Yeah, it was all about finding consistency. Okay. When he did play, it was sparingly at times, but you could see the ball get off. You could see the explosion off the line in the interior, which isn't too common. Of course, you're dealing with some of the bigger guys. You know, you look across the line to uh, Devondre Sweat. I mean, those are big bodies for a reason. But yeah. as I mentioned, I mean, that middle school background of kind of always having the ball in his hand or always being the focal point of an offense or defense really carried over. And once his body got acclimated to weighing 310, 315, 320, then you really started seeing him putting things together. Uh, Byron Murphy, also another guy, he's always played with the chip on his shoulder. And for, I, I say that, you know, you hear that often, but for every defensive line that he's been a part of going back to high school, he's always been looked at the second guy. And I, I, I mean that not as a knock, but in the sense that, yeah, Tavondre Sweat right next to him just won the Outland Award trophy, right? He was the best interior defensive lineman in college. In high school, he was uh, paired up with Shamar Turner at DeSoto, who you yeah. know was a five-star, borderline five-star guy, ended up going to Texas A&M, will be drafted next year as well. I mean, it's going back, he's always been, I have to go prove to other people why I deserve to be a big name. And right now, I mean, he certainly put the tape out there, and I'd be shocked if he you know entered the 20s. Which, speaking of that, because sometimes, you know, certain guys may not like being that person. They want to be the guy, and it, that probably shows a lot for his character, the type of person. Like, he kept pushing through and has been able to push his way all the way up to now where we're talking about him high on draft boards. What would you say his personality is when it comes to on the football field, but also off the football field? Now, on the field, I mean, the best way you can describe it, and he kind of looks like it too. He looks like a bulldog. And I, I mean, <laughs> you just kind of see it in his personality uh, when he's going through drills. I mean, there's there's nice guys. There's nice guys on the field. You know, you, you got your friends. But Byron Murphy's going to – we, we did a poll recently on, on Texas football where uh, if you could have one player on the Texas 2023 team to back you up in a, in a street fight. <laughs> that was almost unanimously uh, Byron Murphy. And I, I, I don't want to mean that in the sense that, you know, they're always fighting or anything, yeah, but yeah. you know, he just kind of has that demeanor, you know, you don't push me around. I push you and I'm going to come after you uh, in the sense that you're going to be worn out by the end of the game. And I mean, we saw that for 14 games last year, he yeah. was all over the place making, you know, instrumental plays time and time again, Texas does not win 12 games and they're the big 12 conference. If it's not for Byron Murphy. Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess that's something you want to hear, too, especially in Chicago. It's a, a very defensive driven place. Uh, we're still in search of the quarterback. We're hoping hoping Caleb's that. But we've been through a lot of ups and downs offensively and defensively has always kind of felt like it was the place where you felt more, most comfortable in Chicago. Let's take a look about his, his versatility a little bit, because he lined up everywhere from nose tackle to even a, some reps at edge. Uh, where do you find him most comfortable? Where do you think he'll fit best when once he hits that next level? Yeah, it was interesting. He was used more inside as a an A gap player than Tavondre Sweat was, who of course we know is three sixty six, mm -hmm. three sixty five. You would kind of figure he would be that guy uh, over the, the the nose at all points. Uh, interestingly enough, it was Byron Murphy more times than than Tavondre Sweat a year ago lined up over the nose. We did see him slide out to about a five tech uh, every now and then. Uh, Pete Kwiatkowski, the Texas defensive coordinator, loves giving different looks with his interior defensive lineman. Where he's most disrupt is is over the center more times than not that center is uh, I don't want to say that the weakest link on an offensive line but they're certainly not the strongest when you consider the tackles and some of the guards that the NFL is now kind of implementing with how big bodies they got in there uh, anywhere he can use his strength because he doesn't have very long arms that's kind of the one knock in his game uh, he can use that quickness and explosion to beat the ball rather than fight through uh, blocks or, or bull rush he will find ways to beat guys with quickness and his first step 
Yeah, which I I feel like we're seeing we've we've seen the knocks on the the arm length in recent years. I know uh, Peter Skaronski was one guy that a lot of people talked about last year. Um, you've seen them still be able to excel because they find ways around what is you know their their one knock. They find ways right. around it. Uh, when it comes to Chicago and where he could fit on that line, that's where like the interesting factor comes in. They have a, a different sweat, Montez sweat, on on one edge, um, on one end, uh, still kind of looking for that other edge position on the inside. A guy named uh, Javon Dexter, who they got from Florida last year, and so there it would be a pretty young line considering it seems like they will draft an edge, and then if it was him and he'd be young, and Javon Dexter would be in year two, Zach Pickens from South Carolina in year two, um, so it could be an interesting young defensive line, but. I feel like it honestly could mesh well. What type of defense um, What did Texas run? Because I know now we say, you know, 3-4, three, 4-3. Four, four, three. There's a mixture of all different types of defenses that a D, a DCs like to run. But what did they focus on there in Texas? Yeah, in a way it was a 2-4-5 in, okay. in a sense that you had your two big bodies and you had, you know, kind of a, a, a plus edge outside linebacker hybrid at a time uh, with the way Texas used things. And, of course, uh, you know, in the Big 12, you have to have your defensive backs on the field. So uh, as long as Tavondre Sweat and Byron Murphy on the field, if you were Texas, you felt very comfortable with whatever personnel surrounded the two of them. But certainly having those two guys in the middle was a focal point of the Texas defense a year ago. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about that. Let's talk about Tavondre uh, Sweat. Unfortunately, got into some trouble this offseason. We're seeing um, some some things about him potentially falling down some boards because of that. Um, what What is your prediction on that? And is, was there ever any other personality character flaw issues or was this kind of an offset thing for him? Yeah, no, it was a, a bit of a surprise. And, you know, knowing Tavondre Sweat, certainly very unfortunate. I'm glad he wasn't seriously injured in that that incident. Um, uh, but he has been up front with NFL scouts, I've been told, about, you know, some of his days at Texas in which he probably – uh, would have liked to head back, uh, mm-hmm. at least in terms of, you know, going out, hanging, having fun. I, I'll yeah. say that. So uh, Tavondre Sweat, certainly a very talented football player. The one knock, and I see it all the time, is can he be a three down player at that weight? That's the big question mark. You don't see many 360 pound plus guys enter the NFL and have down to down to down success. It's a rare yeah. thing. And so for Tavondre Sweat, the, the measurables aren't going to wow you. The times at the combine aren't going to wow you, uh, but then you see him move in person and you start thinking, okay, I, I get it now. You know, he, he's 360 pounds and he's moving significantly better than I thought anybody at this weight would have ever moved. So Tavondre Sweat to me, of course, uh, the, the knock again on the pass rushing, can he be a third down guy? Fair question. Yeah. Uh, if you would have put Texas in the SEC a year ago, he would have had the third most pressures on the quarterback per uh, pro football focus of any interior defensive lineman in the entire conference. Number two, of course, would have been Byron Murphy. So he can get after the quarterback. The question is, can he finish plays where we know in the NFL, if you have a guy like a Patrick Mahomes or a Josh Allen that can extend plays, yeah. it, it, it becomes you know one thing to pressure him, but then getting him on the ground is the gold mine. And that's kind of a knock at the moment with T Sweat. I, I think he falls to the third round, but I don't think he ends up going day three. Yeah, that's a good point, because we do see these like Houdini quarterbacks now. Patrick Mahomes does it. Josh Allen does it. Lamar Jackson does it. Justin Fields does it. It looks like Caleb Williams is one of the guys that can also do it. Um, And in certain moments, it's almost frustrating. I would see I would see situations last year where other teams, you could see players getting frustrated when Justin Fields is scrambling around, running, escaping multiple tackles. So that is an important game when uh, we see these offenses kind of evolving right now to a lot of these players who are able to do that type of thing. Um, when you when you talk about him on the football field, we talk a lot about you just talked hit the one kind of knock is that pass rush and being able to finish. Would you say his two highest marks? Because this is what I've heard a lot about um, his ability to handle double team and then his ability to stop the run. Yeah, without a question of a doubt. Again, he's 365 pounds. That's a big boy. Yeah. You don't see him, you know, multiple yards be, uh, back behind the line of scrimmage too often. Uh, and it, there were a number of times a year ago where Texas – Desperately needed a stop, and that was the guy uh, to make the play. I can I can look at several instances. There were two uh, fourth downs against Rice early in the season where he uh, created tackles for loss. Texas doesn't beat Kansas State in overtime if it's not for Tavondre Sweat batting a ball at the line of scrimmage in which he immediately got pressure on the quarterback on. Uh, there were numerous times where, again, if Tavondre Sweat's not on the field, you look at it and say, yeah, Texas probably gets burned a little bit more than they did. Uh, and so because of that, you know, that Outland Award trophy and the push 
that really started to come a, a, around midseason, it was warranted because every single weekend he was that guy in the middle of the defense making play after play alongside Byron Murphy. So uh, there's no question. I think wherever he ends up, he'll find a home. Uh, he'll, he'll be on the field regularly. Uh, again, how long will he be on the field for drive series possessions? Okay. That's the question mark. But he will be a big time player in the NFL. DJ, we like what we call those big uglies. We Everything, I feel like, starts in the trenches, and it's been such an eyesore for the Bears uh, the last few years where, like, the big negatives have all kind of surrounded the trenches, and it's really affected a lot of both sides of the ball because, obviously, offensively, your quarterback's getting sacked, and you can't run the ball if you if your line's not there, uh, pass right. protection's not there. But then on the other side of the ball, how that trickles down to all the other levels, how it affects your linebackers, how it affects your cornerbacks, um, your safeties, all of these, just this trickle down of if your trenches aren't there, you definitely notice it all over the football field. Uh, let's go ahead and talk about uh, – Adonai Mitchell transferred from Georgia. Uh, you really saw probably the best choice for him, honestly, for his career, his, his him making that move to Texas. But tell us a little bit about what you guys feel improved the most for him to really have his breakout season this last year. Yeah, it was just staying healthy. I mean, this was a talented kid out of most Mar uh, Missouri City, Texas, right outside of Houston that ended up going to Georgia for two years, ended up coming home. He had a, he has a child now in the Houston area, so he wanted to come home, be closer to home. And, of course, NIL helps that as well. So uh, really staying on the field was the biggest thing for him. Coming into uh, his days at, at Texas, four college football playoff career appearances, four touchdowns. He had a, a touchdown in every single game. We knew coming in, he could play in the big games, and he showed up again. He had made a game-saving touchdown against TCU. Uh, he had, a, you know, obviously the big touchdown against Alabama week two, which hurt, helped spur the upset. And, of course, there, a touchdown again against Washington in the playoff. You know he has a big playability. It's all about finding the – uh, consistency in, you know, the intermediate and short routes. Can he be a guy that you can throw a slant to and create separation there to convert a third and six? Can he be a guy that gets open on the dig route uh, as a number two look? That's the question because when the, the ball is designed to go to him, he comes down with it more times than not. Uh, I was shocked to see him run a four, three, four. I did <laughs> not think he had that in him. Uh, certainly, ran faster than I thought he played at times at Texas. That wasn't mm -hmm. something that I think Sarkeesian and the Texas offense uh, displayed of him was that speed. But again, at six, two and a half, six, three, four, three, four, forty, and arguably the best hands of anybody in the regular season in this draft class, he's going to be a hell of a player. Where would you say he would fit in the NFL offense? Is he more of that contested catch 50, 50, go up and get it or more of a deep threat guy? Yeah, I think he's a contested uh, catch guy. And again, okay. that, that four three four, it just didn't shine to me on the field. It, it's yeah. a weird thing. Yeah, that is interesting. But sometimes we see that all the time, the guys that run the 4-4. And some, they say, like, in-game speed is faster than their 4-4s they run. Yeah. Um, some, it's opposite. They just have that quick get off. And so the the speed when they're not having to actually run routes and do all of the other things that involve uh, that you have to do as a wide receiver come into play. Um, tell us a little bit about that Texas offense, though, for people maybe that didn't follow closely uh, closely along. How big of a role did he play in the offense and when they were able to be successful in, in those in those areas? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, coming into the season, Texas obviously had Xavier Worthy. He was going to be your, your year three number one wide receiver uh, for Sarkeesian and Quinn Ewers. That was, you know, the, the – what was understood coming into the season. Xavier Worthy had 100-plus targets in each of the two previous seasons. For the most part, things went through him. And uh, I, I think Adonai Mitchell did a good job complimenting him. Of course, we know the speed of Xavier Worthy taking the tops off of defenses. What can A.D. Mitchell do underneath? That was going to be where he really made his bread and butter. You'd see a lot of him on comebacks, you know, the dig routes, uh, anywhere he was used next to. Xavier Worthy, he came open as a result of the scheme, more so in my eyes than him really creating separation from a defensive back. So if that's going to be a knock, I understand it because, again, NFL cornerbacks are a little bit different than what you see in the Big 12 at time and time again. So uh, he was that number two. He didn't necessarily have a, a long string of consistent gameplay. You know, against, you know, some Iowa State's TCUs, he made big plays. Uh he only averaged about four, four and a half catches per game. Okay. Not a guy that you would see Texas throw the, the kitchen sink at on a given week. Um, so you spoke about that speed, how it, it surprised you. Um, did Worthy's speed surprise you or are you expecting that? 
if you talk to anybody else in the Texas market, they'll probably say, yeah, we expected that. I had him going about 4-4-3, four, 4-4-2. Four, 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 Listen, 4-2-5, four, 4-2-1, two, whatever he ran in the combine, that's fast. People don't do that. Uh, but, you know, again, we've heard about the speed coming in. That was Sarkeesian's first uh, recruit to Texas, and he knew right away we have to get speed, we have to get playmaking ability. And Xavier Worthy running a 4-2-1 after running a 4-2-5, in which I think a lot of people in – uh, the NFL Network uh, at the combine were saying, "Yo, you just ran a four two five. You you don't have to run it again." He's known behind the scenes that he can run faster, that he can touch four two flat, whatever it is. And for him to go out and do that, I was, I mean, I was shocked. Yeah, it's definitely the thing that he wants to show off. Does it surprise you at all that when you look at a lot of draft boards right now? Um, Mitchell seems like, I mean, potentially going 16, 17, 18, 19, and Xavier Worthy's kind of dropped a little later? No, not really, because again, you know, being a wide receiver in the NFL, there's more to just catching the passes and, and, and finding ways open. You know, you have to block, you have to be a teammate, you have to, you know, do all the little things if you're going to be in the NFL. Uh, staying on the field is a big part. And Xavier Worthy's done a great job at that, but again, he's only 165 pounds. You know, you yeah. don't see many guys in the 4-2 range that are 160 pounds thriving right now. You know, uh, Deshaun Jackson was kind of in that range, Marquise uh, Hollywood Brown, you know, it's just not a very uh, common thing to see. So I think the size that AD Mitchell gives you at six, two and a half, uh, you know, two fifteen, running, you know, essentially a four, three. I think that right there gives yeah. you all you need to know uh, when it comes to the NFL con uh, prospect of the two. Yeah, because when you look at this year, we talk the wide receiver draft is one of the ones they talk about being very deep. Uh, you look at just the top of the board with Malik Neighbors and Ro Roma Dunze and Marvin Harrison Jr. And even if you knocked them off, the list of guys that come behind that with a guy like A.D. Mitchell, with a guy like Brian Thomas, um, a lot of these other wide receivers that maybe are going more mid first round, late first round, early second round are still guys that probably in a normal draft, if MHJ and Adunze and neighbors weren't here, would be going in the top probably 15, 16. So it's going to be really interesting this year to see also who transfers the best into the NFL and which guy next year we're talking about. Like, man, I knew he, I knew he was going to be something somewhere. And um, hopefully it's just not in any of the other NFC North teams, because that's something we've seen a lot. We've seen them hit on Je Justin Jefferson and Jordan Addison. It looks like Green Bay's hit on all of their receivers that they've gotten recently with Romeo Dobbs and Reeds and all of that, all of those guys. Um, tell us a little bit about what's going on in Texas. Are, are we going to see, are we seeing Manning? Are we seeing Ewers? What's going on? Yeah, no, it'll be Quinn Ewers in uh, 2024. He is going to be uh, the number one quarterback this year, which means everybody hoping and waiting to see Arch Manning. We'll have to wait till 25. Of course, I think Sarkeesian was very happy that Ewers decided to come back uh, mm -hmm. for year one in the SEC for Texas this year. Uh, Ewers, again, the, the big step for him, I think he does a great job of moving the chains. Uh, what's next for him is taking over football games. There were six games a year ago in which he only had one touchdown pass. Okay. Texas won a number of big games, obviously. Uh, but for him to not necessarily have his big fingerprint on games, that's where he needs to take that next step as an older quarterback in, in college right now. Uh, and certainly in the red zone, Texas was, uh, you know, bottom five in the country in red zone efficiency, turning those – drives into touchdowns right now again with an older quarterback and kind of a revamped rebuilt wide receiving corps at the moment it's got to be up to Quinn to take that next step and get the ball where it needs to be rather than relying on Xavier Worthy, A.B. Mitchell or even Jatavian Sanders to go yeah. up with the play for him. What are the feelings there about that uh, the move to the SEC? Oh there's a lot of excitement yeah I think I think Texas fans have been waiting for this move Sarkeesian certainly built a team ready to compete in the SEC, uh, more so in the trenches than anywhere else at the moment, yeah. which is exactly where Texas lacked uh, in years past. Uh, of course, Kelvin Banks kind of steals the 2025 early first round headlines on that offensive line, but Cam Williams, the right tackle, uh, look for him a little bit to make some noise this year. 6'5", 360, a big boy out of Duncanville. He, he uh, yep. is going to be a first time starter this year. Really, really talented football player. I love it. Those are the I'm a I'm a big offensive line girl. Um, my favorite player on the Bears is Tevin Jenkins, uh, who kind of has played all over the line. But when you were mentioning earlier, it kind of made me think of that, because when you were mentioning earlier, the guys who on the football field are just like when you, you they posted the poll of who would you would want to help you out in a fight or whatever it was. Right. And like the, the bear, someone on someone on Bears Twitter did something recently and everybody was like Tevin Jenkins, which is hilarious almost because like Tevin on the field is 
a bear like he's a monster and then off the field he's goofy and funny and always joking around and singing so i was like but i guess he could flip that switch when he needs to and it sounds like uh that may be like a, a byron murphy type guy too um so Absolutely. it'll be fun i love it um well anyways thanks cj for hopping on with me i really appreciate it like you said maybe we'll get some more longhorns and continue to see rojo continue his career here in chicago too yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Of course, I want to see the Caleb Williams uh, era thrive. He's, you know, yeah. a, a far and away the best quarterback prospect that I've covered in my time. So, well, I didn't I'm even think about that. Tell, tell us about that real quick. Your thoughts on Caleb? Do you think? Do you? Is the hype going to live up if it was in what you what you've seen? I think so, absolutely. And I, I was in person in Dallas when he really made his first, uh, you know, impression in the college football world when he took over for Spencer Rattler and came back from a twenty-eight to seven deficit against Texas. I was there. I saw the magic firsthand. Uh, <laughs> it felt like a completely different Oklahoma team the minute he got on the field. You see the athleticism with the scrambling ability, and I think he will step in. This is going to be a very bold take. So go ahead and get. Uh, I love you know, it. Let's your take your it. headlines right. I think he'll walk into the NFL and have the second best arm in the entire league from day one, right behind Patrick Mahomes. The things that he's able to do on the run, out of the pocket, off balance with different arm angles, you don't see that very often. And I think, you know, folks out West and specifically around the country that watched him, I think they took him for granted in 2023 because they weren't winning to the level yeah. they were in 2022. Yeah, we saw us kind of, and that was a lot of the Bears' criticisms, like Bears fans who maybe didn't watch a whole lot of USC, and especially because a lot of Bears fans are Notre Dame fans, and the, probably one of his worst games in college football was against Notre Dame, uh, kind of all pointed to that. And then they got, went back and started watching film, and they were like, that team was kind of a disaster. Like, the defense wasn't really good. The offensive line wasn't good at all. Um, he was kind of, It seemed like he was having to do almost everything in certain certain aspects, which is what Fields had, had to do the last couple of years, which luckily yep. they fixed some of that. But I will tell you, Bears fans will probably love you for saying that. So it'll, it'll be my headline, and you'll get a lot of love for that one. So thank you. There we go. I'm, I'm, I'm doing my part to get the, the folks <laughs> on my side. All right. Thanks, CJ, and you have a good rest of your day. Alrighty, thank you very much. Thanks. <laughs>